Um, so the seminal academic paper by both Baradek and Newman about the ARPANET, and he is a co-author of that paper. I was the last co-author. Well, they say they put the best to last. <laughs> <laughs> and there were him and two other people who wrote the software for the GIMS, the Internet Message Processors, which were the ARPANET's first routers. Mm -hmm. Not many people. Yesterday, our speaker did something historically massive important, but I would argue if he did more historically massive important, there were lots of Apollo missions. If that one didn't get land the moon, the world would have gone on. Without their work, there wouldn't have been the internet. And then we couldn't have Facebook and acting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we close at five today and have a blast. Until you enjoy. Okay, well first, everyone remembers history differently. This is my version of the history of the ARPANET, and other people in the room may have a different history of the ARPANET. Um, I assume most of you have heard of the ARPANET. For anybody who hasn't, uh, I think there's a plausible argument that it's the precursor of the internet. Um, my email address is here if you have a question. I put some pointers to some more information. Um, in my collection of ARPANET information there. So, here's my outline, six parts. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time on parts two and three, the slightly more technical part. So, in the 1960s, um, the type was ripe for something different than what was happening. At the time, Networks tended to be special purpose, like an airline reservations network, or even in the same company, a different network for logistics. They tended to be special purpose, their purpose was built into the network. The concept that a lot of people could connect to the same network for different purposes uh, was not one that was widespread at the time. Um, the people in this picture are four guys who helped get the world ready for what came next, which was packet switching. Licklider was the visionary who uh, thought that everybody should be connected with everybody else. Kleinrock did queuing analysis uh, that led to some of the math that made the internet possible. Barron wrote a series of reports at RAND uh, about networks with lots of nodes, each communicating with each other. If any of you have ever heard that the ARPANET was somehow to deal with nuclear holocaust, it's a misreading of what he was doing that, that leads to that. The ARPANET had nothing to do with nuclear stuff. And Paul Barron from the National Physical Laboratory in the UK had a team which actually built a prototype, a small prototype, but they never had the money that ARPA had for the ARPANET. Um, so the technology and the economics got right, in particular. Um, mini computers, core memories, uh, the cost of phone lines, and something was going to happen. And that something turned out to be packet switching. Um, ARPA is the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the Department of Defense. It was founded to do advanced research that mostly the military services wish was being spent. They wish another boat or another tank was being built. But it does research that they don't quite envision the use for. A decade later, they come around and say, hey, this is good, we can, we can use that. In particular, there's an office at ARPA called IPTO, Information Processing Techniques Office. Uh, and Licklider, from the previous slide, went there in 1962 and brought his vision of making the computer personal, that everybody should have access. If, you've read, if you haven't read Mitch Waldrop's book, the man who made the per computer personal, you ought to. He's an amazing guy. Um, so he set up this department. He was hiring universities to do research in graphics, time sharing, and so on. All the things that we have today uh, at the various universities. When he left, he brought Ivan Sutherland, who's kind of the father of computer graphics, to ARPA to take over as the, as the chair. And uh, Sutherland. Uh, funded Larry Roberts and Tom Merrill to do an experiment between the Lincoln Lab TX2 and the uh, Q32 Out of Systems Development Corporation in California. Bob Taylor followed um, Sutherland at ARPA, running the IPTO office, 
and he got funding for a network. He was tired of having a terminal in his office for the various different time sharing systems of his different research contractors. And so he said, I want to have one network that everything's hooked to and a computer in my office. He decided he wanted Larry Roberts, who had had the experience of building that experiment, to come to ARPA. Larry didn't want to leave Lincoln Laboratory. So the director of all of ARPA called the director of Lincoln Laboratory and reminded Lincoln Laboratory that they provided you know, some big percentage, like 40% of Lincoln Laboratory's funding. And the director talked to Larry, and Larry went to ARPA. <laughs> <laughs> Once Larry got to ARPA, a lot of stuff began happening. So this is part two. They began holding meetings with the ARPA research contractors. The ARPA research contractors weren't that happy about these meetings because they wanted all their money for their own research and for their own time sharing system. They didn't want to be spending their money on a network that was a common user network. Nonetheless, a guy named Elmer Shapiro at SRI did a study, he led a study group, and they came up with the design, a partial design for what became the ARPANET. A, a request for quotation came out in July of 68. Request for quotation is another word for request for proposal, and I'll say proposal from now on. It was sent to, I don't know, 100 companies or something. Curiously, a few months earlier, we at BBNN had begun working on a design for that ARPANET procurement. Because you always tend to know what the procurements are coming are. You know, you're in the community, you know what's happening. So BBNN put a small team of people together with me, uh, Bob Kahn, Frank Park and Severo Ornstein to begin designing things. Frank, uh, Severo, and I had real-time computing experience. Bob knew communications theory. And he was educating us on what packet switching was. Um, a dozen people bid on it, as that's what I've heard. That's why there's a question mark. We did. We had a, a very detailed bid, um, detailed uh, hardware logic diagrams of a certain level. Um, Will Crowther and I wrote the inner loop and counted the instruction cycles so we could say how many packets per second it can handle. Uh, we designed it for performance, high performance, and for robustness. The robustness issue is that Frank Hart, who's our leader, was kind of control free. And he understood that these machines weren't going to be in central telephone offices. They were going to be in research laboratories at university with engineering graduate students with screwdrivers. <laughs> and he wanted it to really be fixed so the engineering grad students couldn't get in there, get in there and mess with the game. So that's that. Let's go on. We got awarded the contract uh, to be started at the 1st of January of 1969 to build a 4 m network. It was to go to these four locations, the University of Utah, Stanford Research Institute, Palo Alto, University of California at Santa Barbara, and UCLA, UCLA and Westwood, part of, essentially part of Los Angeles. Um, we've heard that Raytheon was the first choice of the committee that did the evaluation, but that Bob Taylor said, no, no, don't hire Raytheon, hire BBNN, because BNN is more like a research place than Raytheon, and will be able to get along with all these ARPA research places who are going to get packet switches. They'll be able to deal with them better. They're more the same kind of people. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. That's what Taylor claims. But in any case, we got the contract. And, and the other, a bunch of other people were funded to do other related work. So, how is it supposed to work? This is it. There's some host operating system, like a Sigma 7 operating system on a Sigma 7 computer. I don't know what that operating system was. You know, some process needs to connect to the network software in the machine. Uh, the network software has to talk to the host host software. By the way, the hosts, the computers on the ARPA network call the hosts. I've never known why, but I'll use that notation. Then the software had to connect to the IMP software, then the IMP hardware, and then the, in the IMP, the IMP to host hardware, um, the IMP to host software, the IMP to IMP software, from one IMP to the next, from end beginning to the other end, the IMP modem hardware. Eventually, 
a message got into the network, it got rooted one way or it got rooted another way, depending on if a line was down or whatever, and it went through the reverse process at the other end. In particular, the whatever the host computer was going to send into the network, whether it's a big file or if it's a little interactive message traffic of a few characters, they got put in things called messages in the request for proposal. That's what they called them. And the message was up to 8,000 bits long. Um, if the thing they were trying to send was bigger than 8,000 bits, the host computers had to take care of splitting it up and putting it back together. Um, the imps then broke those messages of 8,000 bits into packets of 1,000 bits, basically. And those packets were independently routed around the network until they got to the destination imp, at which point they had to be put back together into the message and given to the destination host. The reason, of course, for breaking it into 1,000-bit packets is so the latency on the communication circuit between two imps is not too long at any point. You don't want to have it have to wait for 8,000 bits out in the network somewhere. You need to wait for 1,000 bits. And if the person was just talking, get sending a little teletype traffic, well, then the packet was, you know, 40 words long. It wasn't necessarily 8,000 bits or 20, bit, 20 words long. As I mentioned, there were parallel efforts at other places. The host computers had to do their own hardware and software. Network Analysis Corporation was hired to optimize, um, to minimize delay, maximize reliability, in other words, have duplicate lines and so on, and to minimize cost. AT&T long lines had a contract to deliver those lines, and sometimes they had to deal with regional phone companies. Um, here is one of the topological designs. I forgot to write down what year this was, but it's a relatively early year. Because by 74, there were, I think, 40 imps. I'm not sure. Fort Monmouth, I think, was on the network out here somewhere. But I'm not completely sure. Um, here's a later design. I know that this was from 1980. Because it says that at the top. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Notice there's a link to the University of Hawaii, a uh, link to London, a link to Norsar, that's outside of Oslo. Um, this was one of the first connections to the network, once anything got operating, to send seismic data from a large array, underground array in Norway that was listening for nuclear explosions in Russia. There was another one in Alaska. And that wasn't using you know, any of the stuff we think of as in protocols or host post protocol, that was just sending data bits. Yeah. Um, just two quick technical questions. Uh, yeah. First, did the packets, uh, was there any error correction? Yeah, I'll get to it in a minute. Okay, cool. What's the second? Um, oh, God. Uh, did it handle fragmented packets? Uh, you mean packet broken into smaller <coughs> than 1,000 bits or? No. No, it's, 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 Different than the way it is now when TCP IP just you know has different links than it was. It was homogeneous and there was no need to write that. Okay. So as I said, there were parallel efforts uh, with other organizations. ARPA itself, Larry Roberts is a very technical guy. He was involved all the time in doing math calculations and so on. Uh, UCLA got a contract to do network measurements, um, figure out what the performance was. Stanford Research Institute got a, uh, a contract to keep documentation. The network working group was a bunch of people. How am I doing in my first 10 minutes? You are uh, almost exactly 10 minutes in. OK, good. Thank you. Um, so as I said, we got a contract. And as I told you, Frank Hart was paranoid about the graduate engineers. So it came in a military ruggedized case. Notice the hooks on the top for putting it on the ship. Uh, notice the lock. <laughs> now, now, I don't think that's going to stop the, de the determined graduate engineer, but that was how we did it. Um, the Honeywell 516 was the computer we based it on. Uh, we had in the original IMPS 12 kilohertz 16-bit uh, memory. 
uh, or 24 kilobytes. It's approximately a millisecond cycle time, something of that vicinity. Um, this is the one we delivered first to UCLA. Um, there's a good story about that. We were supposed to deliver one a month in September, October, November, and December of 1969. Uh, we were having trouble getting the Honeywell hardware running um, late in October. And the UCLA guys were running behind and they assumed we wouldn't make it. So they said, oh, we we'll probably have the first two weeks of September to keep working on it. Ben Barker of our engineering team found the bug in the, in the Honeywell CPU timing chain, whatever that is. I'm a software guy, so I don't quite know what those words mean. Um, and he, he changed the wire wrap, and he fixed it, and we shipped the machine, and it got there two days earlier rather than two weeks late, which shocked the UCLA people. Um, here is Another, imp, this is imp 11 from Lincoln Labs. This is now at the Computer History Museum if you want to go see an imp. The UCLA one uh, is at Bolter Hall at UCLA. As far as I know, these are the only two remaining original 516 uh, imps. The guy on the right is Frank Park, our manager, the guy who was worried about graduate students. But he, he grew up on the whirlwind. And he was very concerned about conservative engineering and making things work. And that was probably very good for our team, uh, to make a thing that actually fought hard to not, to not have reliability problems. This is our team, uh, more or less. I'll point out some people. Here's Frank again. Uh, ben Marker is the second hardware engineer. He's the guy that fixed the timing chain. Uh, Severo Ornstein um, did the original logic design as part of the proposal. Bob Kahn is on the far right. He was a member of our team. Will Crowther was the more senior software guy, although the three of us software guys were kind of equal in how we did things, but he certainly had more experience. Will, as some of you may know, did one of the early computer adventure games. Uh, adventure. Advent, I think it was at the time. What was his last name? Sorry. Hmm? Will Crowler. Will Crowler. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, very smart guy. Uh, ben came because Severo taught a hard course at Harvard and recruited Ben. Marty was another engineer, Marty Throat. He worked on the Harvard radio station with Ben, so he came to our team. Uh, the last, I'm here. I'm the other, the third hardware, second hardware guy, the software guy. There's another software guy named Bernie Cosell who just wasn't there the day the picture was taken. Are you putting up your hand or taking a photo? Take a photo. Okay. These three people are the Honeywell engineer who serviced our account, the field service guy. That would be there the day the picture was taken. Truett Thatch, out of DBNN's Los Angeles office, who was going to go along with, who came to Bot Cambridge to go along with the first delivery. And this is Jim Geisman, who was only peripherally involved with our team. But he was the one that organized the celebratory banquet at Joyce Chen's Chinese restaurant. <laughs> so he got in the picture. And so he's been in it ever since. In every encyclopedia, web article, Jim Geisman is right there. He was also a good guitar player. Um, so we delivered the four machines on time, uh, the two days early to UCLA. Um, as soon as um, UCLA and SRI had their hosts up and working, uh, they were talking to each other. This is a page from UCLA Sigma 7 logbook. Brad, are you here somewhere? Brad. Mm -hmm. um, this is the guy who made the log entry. I think it's Charlie Klein. Yep. Uh, ben Barker is our engineer who was there and apparently asked Charlie Klein, would you connect to the Stanford host? Uh, Brad, by the way, Brad Fiddler uh, is at uh, Stevens Institute and is a computer historian who's probably studied the ARPANET more than anybody else uh, in the recent, in the last couple of years. And I think maybe, I don't know, Brad uncovered this log book, but, but that's where I got it, it's from Brad. I had to get it from Brad. Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, 
We continued development even though the first nodes were deliberate because we were making the imp better, finding little bugs, uh, and we were originally doing releases with paper tape. Oh, I should have showed you that back here. Uh, on top right, you see the paper tape reader. That was our input method. Um, for instance, when I went with the fourth imp to UCLA, to do the, not to UCLA, to uh, Salt Lake City, University of Utah, to do the fourth delivery, uh, delivery I took four paper tapes with me, and then I flew on to SRI and gave them one, and then I flew to <laughs> Santa, uh, Santa Barbara and gave them one, and then I flew to Los Angeles and gave them, gave them one. Uh, during those very early days, before the Demian Eddie got hooked up, Cross country, so we could communicate over the network. Uh, I had the computer listing next to my telephone at home overnight at night because I was doing the the maintenance, the software help of all the host sites who were trying to get things working. Early in the next year, I believe Bob Khan and I went out to UCLA and we did an experiment on that first four node network. Okay, it worked. That was good both from the point of view of we made a system that worked, from the point of view of ARPA having something they could say, this worked, from the point of view of the ARPA contractors beginning to say, hey, this is kind of cool, look, we can communicate. And in particular, it's good for the rest of the world. The telephone companies were saying packet switching couldn't work because they didn't want to hear about it. The, the, uh, but it worked. Um, it had bugs, as Mike you might assume, but it ran fast. It didn't crash much. If it did crash, we were with a collaborative host environment and we'd say, please don't do this, which crashes it while we fix it. Uh, they, we'd fix it and then they could do that again. Um, so the focus after these first four nodes was uh, get the host level communications going uh, on top of the imp sub network and make the sub network improve. The imp deliveries com continued for a long time, basically one a month for quite a while. BBNN was number five, and once we had that, we could now work on the network from BBNN, originally with the teletype, uh, and then with the host computer ourselves. Once the, even before we had finished developing the software and shipped the first machine, the host sites were saying, Hey, can we have more than one imp on a host? The request for proposal said one imp on a, one host on an imp. And so we looked at the code and we said, sure. The hardware can handle up to four host interfaces. It's an easy enough fix to make the um, host imp software and host software re-entrant in a crude way. And we had an index register on the machine, so we could <laughs> come from the right interrupt, load up the number in the index register, and then access the tables. And so we did that. Instantly we did that, the host traffic was going intrasite before it was really going intrasite. Now the 360 at UCLA wanted to talk to the Sigma 7 at UCLA, for instance. So we were kind of doing a local area network thing uh, from early in 1970. Uh, we kept... Um, kept improving the code over time, and eventually we added enough communications interface so we could have imps that were in a regional area, not just on campus. Okay, um, so the question that sometimes I'm asked is how could we do so much so fast? My answer is on this slide. First, there was no legacy to deal with. A second, there was not much memory. You couldn't do much. Um, there's a single contractor, as I already mentioned, a collaborative host community. The distributed architecture, because of the way we built the IMPS, and I'll get to that in a minute, the IMPS software with IMPS going up and down and lines going up and down, because we built it, designed it to handle all that, it was easy to add something new. You didn't have to do all kinds of configuration and stuff. And we had a small, highly integrated team with a lot of real-time experience, and with Bob Khan, uh, who could tell us about communications theory. So I think we were a good choice. Any, somebody else could have done it. It might have been different. Uh, but I certainly feel lucky to have been there and been part of the team that got selected. 
Okay, so the next section is let's talk about the design and implementation. <clears throat> I'll start with some overall characteristics of the ARPANET. Question? Mm -hmm. Question? Oh, okay. Um, you mentioned the lack of memory is kind of a good thing. Are you saying it was... Kind no, of I'm not saying it was a good thing from the point of view of having packet buffers. I'm saying it was a good thing from the point of view we couldn't write much code. It kept you from over-engineering the stuff? Well, there's no time to over-engineer anyway. Yeah, yeah. I think we had to ship the machine doing the minimal job. But, but more importantly, you know, today, I don't know what a Cisco router has, a million lines of code or something. You know, none of those protocols it has to handle existed. Uh, in terms of the imps wanting to speak local, was that a result of rough preference? Was that a result of what? Route preference, the devices looked local before looking elsewhere? No, 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 it, it, uh, I'll get to that in just a second about the, the addressing. As soon as I get to addressing, you're gonna understand. Uh, do you think about like, the testing? Uh, did you like connect these things together locally in your lab before you shipped? Like, we, you we, they were coming from Honeywell. We had our first development machine. There was a first engineering machine. A hardware engineering machine. One would come, we had two or three at any one time, we'd ship one and another one would come. So we certainly weren't doing big network tests, which was a problem. Once we got, you know, a bunch of things out in the field, the bug that happens, a software bug that happens once a day is suddenly happening four times a day. Uh, or, or when you have 40 imps, it's handily happening 40 times a day. So we got things pretty debugged. Let me go on. Uh, and there'll be a question period at the end. Um, reliable transmission. The question was, was there checksums and so on? Uh, the imp hardware, I'll go on to the next slide. The imp hardware that dealt with the modems um, put a 24-bit CRC on it um, as it went out, the hardware as the packet went out and the destination uh, modem interface at the other end of the line checked that. I'll come back to that in a minute, what happens when that breaks. Um, and if it, if it didn't check, it threw the packet away. So the software had to deal with the possibility if a packet got lost on a phone line because of noise on the phone line. Back then, the no phone lines were kind of noisy, 50 kilobit phone uh, uh, phone lines using Bell 303 modems. Again, I'm reciting all this without knowing what those words mean. Um, they so now if the if if the packet gets into the next imp, the next imp can send back to the sending imp an acknowledgement. But if the acknowledgement doesn't come back, what happened? Well, it could be the packet didn't get there. It could be the packet got there, but uh, the acknowledgement got lost. If you 